trusting him till earth be passed, till within the jasper wall, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting him whatever befall, trust an easy song to sing, a hard song to live. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, it's been a long couple weeks with Vacation Bible School. Finally, we can all inhale and exhale. It's been a good couple weeks, but it's been busy. Let's open with a word of prayer, and we'll begin the service. Brother Lamb, would you pray for us tonight? Amen. You may be seated. Young people, you're dismissed to your Patch the Pirate and Pee Wee Club. Patch the Pirate and Pee Wee Club. And anyone who feels like a child tonight, you can go too. All right. Good. Are they feeding them? <laughs> I don't know what's on the menu. I guess that would determine if some of you went or not. All right, uh, Brother Brian, would you come up and read our missionary letter? Um, this is the Christian family in Romania. Um, I, they sent us another update letter. We want to we wanna keep up with them. So would you read it for us? Dear faithful supporters, brothers in Christ, and sisters in Christ, the Lord God of our fathers, our not thou God in heaven, and in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee. Second Chronicles 26. Yes, God rules over all, all that happens to our earth right now. And in the worst times, he will be God and help us accomplish everything is in his plan for his glory and the salvation of the lost. In spite of the war close to our borders, the work in prison is flourishing in an amazing way. It seems that the doors are opening wide for face-to-face -face programs again. We are again working in 16 men prisons, two women prisons, and have prisoners enrolled in our Bible Institute from 26 prisons of Romania. God is good. We are praying every month for at least five people to get saved in prison. But God worked and 40 prisoners understood and received the gift of salvation since till our last newsletter. Please rejoice with the heaven and us about these saved souls. We are very encouraged testimonies like these. I think that what is going on in my life right now is part of God's plan for my life because the door of my heart is wide open and I am truly willing to serve God lovingly with all my heart. I've learned studying the Bible that I need to follow God's way now, today, not tomorrow, or the day after because it might be too late. And God is near to all those who sincerely wants to follow him. If we postpone the encounter with God, we will have another chance. The, the people from Ukraine we are hosting in our office are well and they enjoy so much to have a peaceful and safe place for them and their children. Many Ukrainians who were hosted in hotels in our area are forced to leave their rooms as the summer is coming and the tourists will arrive soon for their vacations. Our area is a resort area. It will be so hard on those people to find a place to stay. So our guests are so grateful. Two of our ladies husbands who were working on the shipping companies came to Romania, but of course they will have to go again on the sea and they are so happy that they can leave their families here with us. As the war doesn't seem to come to an end, they will continue coming here with us. Thank you so much, so, so much to all of you who decided to send us a help so we can be a help for these poor people. Your financial support means a lot. 
But beside the shelter we offer, we are so happy to tell you that they are more and more interested in knowing God. So we were doing everything is our, in our power to make them feel welcome in our church, to have a good translator of the message, and we are happy to say that they are attending the services in church faithfully. Also, one of our Romanian ladies who speaks Russian, helped by Sister Natasa Fischenko, Brother Alex Fischenko's wife, the ROA missionary to, U to Ukraine, is having Bible study with the Ukrainian ladies once a week. Today, Ronell's, and Ronell's had a talk with one of the ladies who was studying about how her sin can be forgiven. The burden on their shoulders is big, not just the war, but the heavy burden of their sins. These people, or most of them, are, art, are orthodox, but don't have too much knowledge about the gift of salvation. We are trying, though, every, everything we are doing to show God's love, and through your gifts, we are able to do this. Thank you. Our family is doing well. Our children are faithful in church and blessed with good health and strength to work in their good jobs. God is so good and he is responding to our prayers more than we deserve. We had the opportunity to meet all our children as we celebrated Ronella's 60th birthday. We're so grateful for God's mercy upon us. Please pray for Ronella's parents. Some of you have met them, so good people who serve the Lord, but they are getting old and their health is not good. We need wisdom and un to understand how we can be a better help for them. Thank you again for continuing to be our partners at the ministry for sending help and for praying for us. May God bless all and each of you. Marcia and Ronella Christine, Missionaries for Christ. Amen. What a blessing. What an answer to prayer for those of you who pray for our missionaries. Several are getting... How many did you read uh, Got Saved in the Prison since the last letter? Brother Brian, did you have that? I can't remember the number. 40? Was it 40? So not only does he ask for numbers, but he follows up with them in the prisons. He gives them pamphlets, and then they have to go through discipleship, and they answer back to him. It's incredible how he does it. So pray for the, the Christian family there in Romania, and of course, they're supporting those who've been misplaced out of, uh, out of Ukraine. Uh, my goodness, it's been a, quite, a, quite a tough time over there. All right, let's take our hymnals. Go to hymn 330. We're going to sing the first verse. Verse of 330, then we'll shake hands and greet one another. Look to the Lamb of God. Page 330. If you have sinned and are longing to be free, look to the Lamb of God. Shake hands and greet one another.
All righty, as we make our way back to our seats, we'll sing that last verse. Fear not from sin, or the pathway fall. Look to the Lamb of God. Enjoy our sorrow, Christ is all in all. and you may be seated. Oh, Chiron's the last one, so Chiron's the blabbermouth. Oh, no! <laughs> it's Brother Gary! <laughs> oh, it's Brother Lane. Oh, no, it's Brother Gary for sure. <laughs> We, we need a trophy to hand around, a blabbermouth of the night, or I don't know what we're going to do. Is that too disrespectful? Can I say that on Facebook? The, nobody get offended with me, all right? Don't turn me into the, the church police. So, the, the, the brethren, don't turn me into the brethren. All right. Um, a lot of things coming up. Um, of course, this Saturday, we'll see with the rain. I don't want to pray that there is no rain because we need rain. But this Saturday, uh, we'll have um, our the picnic at our house. Um, really try to carpool if you have family or if you have any friends. <laughs> try to come together in one vehicle if you would. Um, just parking. When you get there, um, I'll probably be around to make sure we all park um, decently and in order and uh, we're gonna we're gonna make it all work so and uh, some of you you've asked if, if you want to bring some fireworks feel free to and uh, we'll have a good time afterward um, and then this coming Sunday night after the evening service we'll have a very brief business meeting there's one matter of business that will be discussed uh, very brief uh, but this Sunday night after the service we'll have that um, and then this coming Sunday morning we're no longer having our prayer times on Saturdays for the men or uh, at the same time for the ladies on Sunday. Starting this Sunday, we are going to start our men's prayer time at 9 o'clock. And I think the men are on this side, correct? And uh, men at 9 o'clock come in. Um, I know there will be a couple that will be leading it. But just come in to pray and ask God to bless the service. More than anything else, we need to pray. Ladies will be on this side. We've got chairs set up. If you'd like to come and uh, you come and you pray. Um, I think it'd be a really good thing if you can make it. Um, really try. Um, take time to prepare your hearts, number one, for Sundays. I know how it is on Sunday. We get up. We just wake up, we get our coffee, and we're, just, we're doing good to get here. But take some time to prepare your heart in prayer. And I'd encourage you to use these opportunities if you could. And I know it is 9 o'clock, that is a little early, but uh, be in prayer about that. Um, also, we are going to have on July 31st. We are going to have a backpack giveaway for our community. A backpack giveaway for our community. And what we're going to do this coming Sunday, we're going to have a list on the back that you can sign up to bring stuff for that backpack giveaway. And we're going to actually ask you to bring in backpacks, bring in pens, markers, and we're going to try to encourage our community uh, to come in and to get a backpack for school. And uh, so if you have any questions on that, you can talk to Miss Melissa about that. They're going to have that uh, the the thing you can sign up. If you don't want to go out and buy stuff, you just want to give money, you can designate that on the offering envelopes, and we're going to do all of that. I'm looking forward to that opportunity this year. Ushers, go ahead and come forward. We also have several outreach activities we're going to be starting here very soon in the next few months. Different ways to reach the community. I think there's more ways than going just door knocking. So we're going to have some different ideas and different thoughts here in the next upcoming months that you can get involved in to reach our community. So you be in prayer about that and be in prayer about our building. And um, I do want to just make a quick note. I'll say this again Sunday. Um, we did not reach our monthly goal for missions giving this last month. So make sure if you promise to give, um, there's plenty of money there, but make sure if you promise to give, do that this coming month. Uh, make sure that's very important to keep up with that on top of your normal giving to the Lord. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll take up the offering. Brother Sean, would you pray? Uh, 
And as they take that up, let's turn to page 269 in our hymn books. 269, where could I go but to the Lord? I love this verse that goes along with us. Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. So glad we can do that. Amen. Amen. 269. We'll sing the first. Uh, this is the first and last verse on this. You don't have it. Okay, we're going to sing it a cappella then. Living below in this so simple world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Life here is grand with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hands of death, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Pastor. All right, there is no other logical place to go. Uh, that at least you, you'll not find fulfillment, that's for sure. All right, take your prayer list tonight. A lot of things to pray for. Um, we do need to continue to rejoice in... Um the overturning of Roe versus Wade, we continue as a church. Um, it's not because we, we hate people or mad at people. I know I was accused of that recently. It's because uh, the baby's life means something. And um, we need to be encouraging people and loving people. And I do believe the church needs to step up and love and care for. And uh, I pray that we'll be a lighthouse to our community. And uh, But we do need to rejoice. This is something, if you've been a Christian uh, for any amount of time, that's been on your heart. I mean a true Christian. <laughs> that's been on your heart. So uh, we rejoice and we praise God for that in our country. And um, we want to see more things turn for the cause of Christ. You say, Pastor, you think this will turn into a revival? I don't know. I hope so. I'm praying for one. I don't know. But um, let's just uh, be excited in the Lord. Looks like uh, someone sent me a... Through Facebook, they sent a prayer request. If you do have a prayer request and you're on Facebook, you're not able to be here uh, due to health concerns and different things, um, we'll make sure we get that. All right, what are you praying for this evening? Everybody's life's good. Yes, ma'am. How many of you have unspoken prayer requests? Don't want to say it out loud, but it's on your heart right now. Twenty-five unspoken. Also put on there, um, Miss Retha, if you would, Retha Brumley. She, um, let's see now, did she break? She broke a part of her arm. Was it her wrist? Her shoulder. Miss Retha Brumley, for those of you who don't know, she plays our organ. Uh, she won't be playing for a little bit, but she, uh, she hurt herself pretty bad. Um, you're the one who broke your wrist, and that's why I'm thinking, uh, pray for Kyron, if you would, broke his wrist. Um, when was that, today, yesterday? It's on Saturday? Oh, my goodness. So pray for Miss Retha and uh, Kyron, if you would. Kyron, how do you spell your name? K-Y-R-A-N, K-Y-R-A-N for Kyron, prayer for him. All right, somebody else tonight? Um, would you pray for Annie Madden's grandpa? He'll be having an MRI and a CAT scan. Well, most of you remember Miss Annie. Yes, ma'am.
Okay. So they've got to keep up with more medicine. Is that what they're suggesting? To keep up with the blood volume? Would you pray um, for the balance with the, the medicine, with the blood, and with the baby? And um, just, uh, I know seizures have become a little more and more lately. So would you just be in prayer? Oh, boy. Okay. Anybody else this evening? Yes, sir. She's starting treatment for cancer tomorrow. Okay, would you pray for Dallas's cousin, Olivia Taylor, starting cancer treatment tomorrow, and that is just a, a nightmare. Boy. Um, yes, sir. Yes, would you continue to pray for Carolyn? And, uh, of course, Miss Tony can pray for her as well. All right. Said everything tonight. Yes, sir. Brother Houston. Oh, uh, pray as I prepare. Um, pray for me as I prepare and I study God's word, if you would. Um, I have a funeral this Friday uh, for a family. So if you'd pray for me for that. And then um, pray, as, uh, pray that God would give me wisdom. Brother Houston asked how you could pray for me. Pray that God would give wisdom as to who to call in to fix certain parts of our building. Um, this is an older building, so we're always looking at different things. We just pray for God's wisdom. Um, I'd, I'd like to bring people to the church to, um, uh, you know, to have options as to what we can do for our building, and I'd really like wisdom in that area. Thank you. All right, anything else tonight? All right. Let's, uh, let's be faithful to pray for these folks. Look around the room. And um, think about someone you can pray for. Just maybe look around or think someone in your head and say, uh, maybe let the Lord put somebody on your heart right now. Because um, somebody, everybody in this room is going through something. Sometimes we don't know how severe that really is. We don't know all the pain that is deep inside. So would you all take time to pray for each other and uh, let the Lord work on your heart. This morning, uh, somebody's name popped into my head and I uh, just prayed for them for most of the day. We've been praying for them. So really try to be open to that. The book of Luke chapter 8, if you would, tonight. Luke chapter 8. We'll take some time to pray at the end. Make sure, I hope you'll take some time to pray um, and really get a hold of the Lord. We've got to get a hold of this idea of prayer. As a church, we have to. That is something we need to do as a church. Luke chapter 8, a powerful message tonight as I was studying today. Um, I'm very encouraged uh, with the message tonight. Excited um, to see some, uh, some parts of God's word that we can apply to our lives tonight. Luke chapter 8, I'm going to jump right in. Luke chapter 8, verse 40. We see Luke is the third gospel in the New Testament. It's, um, I would say Luke goes into more details in certain things than some of the other gospels. I personally I personally believe that was because of some of the time he spent with Paul. Um, time he got first, I uh, talked with Paul, and Paul was a very knowledgeable man, uh, taught by the by the Lord. Um, Luke records uh, miracles, sermons, conversations, personal feelings. Uh, Luke goes into it seems a little more of the obviously he was a physician, so he almost seems to go into more of the 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 the, the, the pains of people, the struggles of people, and he points certain things out that others may not. Um, he, he points out uh, people who came to uh, point out that. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and uh, Luke shows us how he lived, and how he died, and how he rose again. Um, it was uh, written in a way that Jewish and non-Jewish believers could understand it, and uh, what a wonderful book. Um, what a blessing. I'm going to jump right in tonight. Luke chapter 8, jump down to verse 40. We'll review here in just a moment, but would you follow along in verse 40? If you don't have a Bible, grab one. I want you to read right along with us. There is power in God's word, okay? Luke chapter 8, verse 40. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him. 
For they were all waiting for him. The word waiting there is the idea of anticipating. Um, you know, whenever uh, my uncle would come over, when we were younger, we would always anticipate uncle getting there. And he was always late. If you're listening, uncle, forget that. He was always late, but we were always ready for him to come. Why? Because he would always have goodies for us. Usually he would buy us pizza or he'd bring snacks or we'd get ice cream. Or now that we're older, he goes and buys steak, right? Uh, the, the important things in life. But they were waiting with anticipation. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come un into his house. Now this was the problem. For he had only, or excuse me, had one only daughter. About 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. The word throng means to suffocate, means to be overbearing, if you will. And a woman was having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. Let's pray. Lord, we need you tonight, God, in these next few moments. Lord, each one in here has a need, and I pray that you would meet that. And, uh, Lord, you would help us to leave here uh, stronger in our faith, more devoted to serve you. And, uh, God, if you, someone here who may not know you or may watch this or listen to this via Facebook, Lord, I pray you would work on their hearts even now. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We see uh, it's a complex story here. We see Jesus in this passage. Um, we see that Jesus is coming. He's going throughout the kingdom of God. You remember in the first couple verses, he's teaching the things about the kingdom of God. We discussed that. And then we saw what you do with the word of God with the parable of the sower. It would go on certain ground and there's different ways people would respond to the word of God or to the gospel. Different ways it would happen. And then you saw in verse 16 through 18, you saw we are not to hide that. We are to be good examples of the gospel of the truth. We are to be showing that. Uh, we always sing that song, This Little Light of Mine, but it's right there in the Bible. That's what we are to be doing. Lights for the Lord. And then we see uh, Jesus' burden for the family around him. And then we saw Jesus would get on a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee. And you remember he would calm a storm. He'd get there and the disciples would be fearing and fretting. And these were uh, fishermen who'd been on the water before. They knew the Sea of Galilee. This was probably an unusual storm. And then he gets to the other side and what confronts him? A man possessed with devils, you remember? Comes up to him. Several demons inside of him. I don't know how many. I personally don't know if he went and the, the demons knew Jesus was coming and they went and got reinforcements. I don't know how all that realm worked, but I do know he got over there and this man who was possessed of the devils and the demons spoke through this man. By the way, that happens quite a bit in our day and age. Maybe not as much, we don't see it as much around us as maybe some countries might, but it's definitely here. So you remember at the end of that story... You remember what happened? All the people came and they'd seen this man in his right mind. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And you remember what happens? You remember the story? Come back. All the people come back. And what do they do with Jesus? Oh my word, you're the Messiah. You have all power. You have control of demons. No, what did they do? They said, get out of here. You're, you're strange. You're not welcome here. Leave. Get away from us. I... I know, I know, and I understand some reasons they came out. They're like, man, our, the, the hogs are gone, and they shouldn't have been doing that anyway. It was an illegal business they were running, but they had no business doing that anyway. But they say, Jesus, get out of here. And to be honest, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if they ever had another chance to accept him. I don't know. But man, what a bad way to end the story. So they get on the boat again. He's done all these great things. He comes back across the water, the Sea of Galilee, and pick up in verse 40. As he's coming back, the people gladly received him. The people gladly received him. There's a story that when George Washington's father died, when he was just 11, for a time the young Washington had his heart set on joining the British Navy. However, his mother had some serious reservations about that path and eventually strongly urged him to reconsider. He listened to his mother and rather than becoming the captain of a ship, he became the commander in chief of the entire military forces of the United States of America. And God would use him in a great way. 
Much of our lives is determined by the input of other people, who we allow to influence us. And it's interesting, those that were on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, they became a hostile mob, hostile mob, and they came and said, Jesus, get out of here. Jesus comes back, and everybody's excited. They're ready to see him. Imagine what those people across the sea missed because they kicked Jesus out. Imagine how many people could have been healed. Imagine all the things that could have been done. But they said, Jesus, we don't want you. We're not interested in what you offer. My friend, I don't want to make too much of that tonight, but there is a side of that where some people, they say, Jesus, I'm good, and they have no idea what they're missing. Those of us who've experienced a relationship with Jesus Christ, experienced the fact that we're justified, we're forgiven, we're redeemed, we're reconciled, we're on our way to heaven, there's something there. Now, we may not always act the way we should, but we know we have a relationship. We didn't push him away when he came knocking on our heart's door. We received the gift that God gave. They said, no, we don't want you. And you remember that man, he, he, the maniac who was uh, brought to Christ and he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Remember what he tried to do? He tried to get in the boat. Jesus said, no, 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 you, I don't, I'm not bringing you with me. You stay there and you tell other people about me. You tell them what happened. And he would. And Lord willing, he, you know, several people came to Christ later because of his message. But we see here in the story, he comes to the other side and they're all waiting for him with anticipation. If you're taking notes tonight, I want you to see and write down this word sorrow, a word you and I can relate to an awful lot. Sorrow. I want you to write down this word sorrow. The, I want you to think in our story so far in our chapter here, we see that so many people wanted something from Jesus. They were begging the demons were begging Jesus. You remember what they said? Don't cast us out. It's not our time. Don't, don't put us into a place where we can't get out of. Put us into the swine so we can keep going. Put a, get, don't, don't, don't cast us out, Jesus. You remember the maniac. What was he begging him to do? Can I go with you? You remember Jairus, uh, as he comes up, this man we're going to see in a minute, he's begging Jesus to heal his daughter. Look here at chapter or verse 41. We see this passion, we see this sorrow, we see this pain. As he leaves, he's not there, but as he starts coming back, it seems to me that people are waiting on him. Word gets around that Jesus' boat is coming back. Look at verse 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. Now, it would not function as a church, but I don't want to make it sound like that. But he was a leader in the religious building, in the religious realm. He would have been a very well-respected man. He would have had pull. He would have had position. He would have had a little bit of authority over the people's opinions and thoughts. He comes up to Jesus. I, I can just imagine, as the crowd comes up, Jairus knows that his daughter's dying. His only daughter. And I can just imagine this dad who knows he's got to get to Jesus. With desperation, he pushes people out of the way. And maybe he gets his way through. One way or another, he gets through. He gets to Jesus. This sorrow. I want you to write down under sorrow. I want you to write this idea. Your position does not make you exempt from life's difficulties and problems. All of you have a position of some type. Maybe you're a son, maybe you're a daughter, maybe you're a mother, maybe you're a father, maybe you're a leader, maybe you're this, maybe you're a supervisor. Whatever it may be, you have a position of some type. Everyone in this room. Your position, no matter how great you may think you are, does not make you exempt from life's difficulties and problems. We're going to talk a lot about that this, this coming Sunday um, from the book of Exodus. We're going to be there this Sunday morning, Lord willing. He comes to Jesus and he says, please come and heal my daughter. He was a religious overseer. What, what was his desperation? My daughter's dying. Let's go on here in verse 41 down at the end. He besought him that he would come into his house. Now, when Jesus came through in chapter 6, you remember he healed the man with the withered hand? You remember what did the religious people tell him? Um, you're not allowed to do that on this day. You have to get out of here. I don't know this for a fact, but it's possible that Jairus was one of the people around that asked Jesus to leave. Possible. I'm not saying it was. I'm saying it could have been. He could have been one of them. 
But obviously he knew Jesus had some type of power. So it's possible he saw Jesus heal this man with the withered hand and he knew he had to get to Jesus. This desperation. The doctor said there's no hope. Your daughter's dying. What's your desperation? Where do you go to? Where do you head? Sometimes I wonder if God doesn't bring us through trying times to get us to be desperate for Him. Because I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of times where I do the Christian thing. I walk the Christian way. I do the Christian thing. But I don't really have a need for, from God. I don't want to say this and sound really bad, but aren't there times in our life where we don't really need anything? It's just easy going. I think there's times in our Christian lives, as a matter of fact, the Bible teaches us there are, there are times where God allows trials just to get our attention, so we put our focus back on Him. I think there's times we just put it on cruise control. And I think more of us need to have this determination to get to Jesus with our life and different things. I think that's pretty important. He comes to Jesus, and it's different from the, the centurion. You remember when the centurion came to Jesus? He said, Jesus, you remember earlier in the book? He said, Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. Remember he said that? You don't have to come there. I know just by you saying it, he can be healed. So I don't think this leader had as much faith as the centurion did, but I do know he had faith that Jesus could heal his daughter. I think there are different levels of faith. And I think we see this, this, uh, this, this separation in their types of faith. But he comes. And notice what's taking place in verse 42. For he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And we already said that means they were all over him. They were suffocating him. Friend, that's why I like to go, if we ever go to like the, uh, when the, the carnival's in town... You know, I always want the elephant ears from the, 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 the trucks, right? I want the really food that's really bad for you. But I always tell my wife, if we go to those things, I want to be there as soon as it opens. Because I want to leave before the crowd comes. I don't like the late nights. I don't like the crazy meat. I want to get there, have fun. I don't want to sit in lines. I cannot stand Six Flags and different things, these theme parks, because I don't like lines. I don't want people touching me. I don't want people around my shoulder. I don't want people breathing around my neck. I don't like any of that stuff. But as Jesus comes, he's like a celebrity, and people are all over him. And Jairus knows he has to get to Jesus. And and nothing is going to stop him. And it's with this determination, he gets up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, you've got to come to my house. My daughter's dying. The doctors, they can't do anything. Other people, they are no help. You're the only one who can take care of my situation. Sometimes I think we need to be praying like that. I think sometimes we put it on cruise control and we don't pray like that. I'll get to you. I've got to get a hold of you, God. It's more of a, God, I've got 10 minutes. Let me fit you in. Um, God, let me pray. Let me read my Bible for I'll fit you in. At, at the end of those 10 minutes, ding, you're done. God, thank you. It's, it was good to fellowship with you today. Instead of a, I'm not leaving until God, I, you speak to me from your word. I'm not just going to read a chapter that I've read 16 times. I'm going to read it and I'm going to read until God, you get a hold of my heart, until you soften me. I don't want to leave here until I've worshipped. I think this type of attitude, I'm not going to leave Jesus until I get your attention. Now, Jesus is going to help this man. And notice verse 43. Notice this situation that comes up. Notice the sorrow. Notice the sickness. Look at verse 43. And a woman, having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent, notice this phrase, all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. So we've seen the sorrow of this father. Now we see the sickness of this woman. So as Jesus is going, you've got a picture with me how many people are all around him. And I'm assuming, just assuming his disciples are probably, you know, kind of trying to be security. That's just how it plays in my head. You know, just trying to give him a little room to move around. You know, you see celebrities come and they have security guards all around them and they make sure you don't get too close. Maybe I'm off on that, but I, I just picture that in my mind that the disciples are saying, all right, Jesus, we'll see you in a minute. Hold on, move back. Let's get through. And as he's going, all these people are around him. And a lady comes to him. She comes behind him in verse 44. She touches the border of his garment. The idea of touch is not the idea of, you know, rubbing your finger against. The idea is the, the, the idea of grabbing. 
So in, in the, I don't remember if it's Leviticus or Deuteronomy, in, in one of those books it, it talks about the garments and sometimes there would be four tassels, one on each corner of the garment, and they would be blue tassels. And it would be reminder to follow God's law. But chances are on Jesus' robe he would have some type of tassel. And from what I understand in studying this, um, and I'm not dogmatic on it, but from what I understand she grabbed, and it's possible she grabbed one of those tassels and she's held on to it for a moment. Now, in this ideology and in this thought, she grabbed onto fabric, but it was not the fabric that would heal her. It was her faith. It was her faith. Notice this sickness, this sorrow. Notice this position does not make him exempt from life's difficulties and problems. But listen, listen, don't miss this. Under sickness, I want you to write this. Your presence does not make you rush God's agenda. Your presence, and if make that grammatically better, I understand. But your presence does not make you rush God's agenda. Your desperation is understood and known by God. And as this dad of this daughter who's passing away, he says, Jesus, come on. And I can see the dad running ahead saying, get out of the way, move it, we're coming through, move. And Jesus stops for a minute. He's looking around. Now, I don't think this event took very long, but I can only see Jairus uh, sitting there saying, Jesus, we got to go. Jesus, everyone's touching you. Don't worry, but come on, we got to go. Some, uh, my daughter's in trouble. Sometimes we want to push God into our agenda. Was this an emergency, yes or no? Did God know this was an emergency, yes or no? Absolutely. But isn't it just like us to say, God, come on, come on. Don't, God, don't worry about that. Come on, they're getting help. I'm not. God, come on. Move along. we got stuff to do. I need you to take care of this. And I think that's what this man was doing. I can imagine in this crowd. And he had a good reason to do so. But Jesus stops. And here's a woman. She's been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years. She's tried everything possible. No doctors could help her. Sadly, isn't that the case today? No one could help in her condition, she was unclean for 12 years. Nobody could hug her for 12 years. She couldn't go up to one of her friends and, you know, play Uno and, you know, have a hug afterwards. She couldn't be near him for 12 years. The bed she would lie on could not be touched by somebody or they would be declared unclean. Some believe that this type of pain, this type of sickness, if you will, was a result of moral failure. So in some people's eyes in this culture, they would have thought this woman would mess around with people. So she could not have, she wasn't allowed to be hugged. She wasn't allowed to have anyone close to her. Uh, she was looked upon as possibly morally corrupt. People didn't understand her situation. She's in pain. The Bible goes on to say, Luke the physician, the doctors are not able to do anything. She, listen, she could not go to the temple to worship. What were the Jews known for? Going to the temple to worship. It was the place they would come together and worship and remember the Passover and remember different feasts. She couldn't go for 12 years. Lonely, alone, hurt, probably gossiped about, a lot of pain. 12 years, she comes and she knows if she can just get a hold of Jesus, she'll be healed. 12 years of misery, 12 years of darkness, 12 years of weakness, 12 years of hopelessness. Now what happens? She put her hand out. She grabbed a hold of the fabric. She grabbed a hold. Notice verse 44. She came behind, touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood was stanched. That word means stopped. The problem was fixed, but it wasn't the fact that she reached out and touched the garment. It was the fact of her faith. The fact of her faith. And Jesus took notice of her faith. And Jesus said, look at verse 45, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and sayest thou who touched me? In other words, Jesus, what are you saying? Everyone's touching you. Everyone wants to get close to you. Everyone wants to be near you. What do you mean, who touched you? And he's looking around. And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. 
He recognized her faith, not just her action, because everyone around him was trying to touch him. But by faith, she was healed. Now, listen very closely. This woman, if she came forward, she would be at risk of turning everyone in the crowd against her. Because right now, she was not to be there. She was unclean. She wasn't allowed to be with people. Imagine this. If she touched Jesus, the rabbi, Jesus would have to go for a day. He would be declared unclean by the priest. This would be humiliating. This would be dis degrading. This would hurt her reputation even more. So that's why she didn't say it out right away. But eventually Jesus looks around and the woman is convicted. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. I love this about Jesus. Even though there was sorrow, Jesus took time to heal this sickness because nobody can rush his agenda. She grasped onto. She would not be satisfied until she got his attention. Now she had it. Now she was close. Now she was healed. Wow. I know we've read this story. We understand this story. And man, it's cool. Jesus heals. But do we understand Jesus changed a life? He did. Not the woman grabbing the coat. Not the woman grabbing the tassel. Jesus changed a life. How many of you have ever seen, um, um, you know, TV preachers or different things say, if you call in now and you buy this, we'll pray over it. We'll send it to you. Man, I know family that bought uh, hankies that were prayed over, and one had uh, one you could buy that the preacher, I don't remember his name, but he would use it to wipe his forehead during while he preached, and you could buy that for whatever it was, 1999, and it would come to your house, and if you prayed over it, you would be healed of your problem. What is that? That's a bunch of fabric. No faith. You understand, it was not that fabric that made the difference. It was the faith behind it. My friend, tonight, it's not about the prayer we're going to pray. It's not about the words you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will guide you when you pray. The Holy Spirit will lead you in that area. But my friend, it's the faith wherewith we pray with. It's not about the position necessarily all the time. It's not about this and it's not about that. It's not about if there's air. It's not about if you're driving. It's not about all the different parts of it. It's about the faith and the heart where it comes from. And as she came to Jesus, it was fearful. She could get in trouble. She could be kicked out of the city more than just be declared unclean. She would have people hate her even more. Notice what Jesus said to her. Notice, I'll, I'll wrap this up. Verse 48, and he said unto her daughter... Be of good, what? Comfort. You came here in dismay. You came here in distress. You came here in pain. You came here in sorrow. Be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now this is very important what Jesus is about to say. The rabbi, the master, he says, go in what? She came with pain and sorrow. And Jesus said, go in peace. Much of our problems, listen, much of our problems are because a lack of faith. And I'm just as guilty. Let's not point the finger, let's point the fingers at herself. We see she came and Jesus changed her when he came to him. Well, he yet spake, there cometh another one from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Thy daughter is, and this is the worst news you could possibly get as a dad. Your daughter is dead. Stop bugging him. Trouble not the master. So as Jesus is standing here, and this probably didn't last for too long. I couldn't imagine it did. But as they're waiting, Jairus is saying, Jesus, come on. I know she's a good lady. I know this is good. Come on. Servant runs up. I don't know if he whispered or if he shouted it out. Girl's dead. We don't need him anymore. There was enough faith to heal sickness, but they didn't think it would lead into this. Jesus, we don't need you right now. This is a false perception. What can Jesus do? Anything. We limit him so often. Now, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, go home and pray over your, you know, dead loved ones who've 
passed away several years ago and say, come back. No, I'm not necessarily saying that. But I think we limit God and his ability. He comes and he says, don't worry, don't get him anymore. But Jesus overhears it. I love this. He's just taking care of this. He's just taking care of demonic man. He's just called the sea all in this one chapter. And now they come to him with the biggest problem of all. She's dead. He said, don't worry about it. What did he tell him to do? Look at verse 50. Fear not. And what? That would be a verse that we should put in our homes. Fear not, only believe. That would be a great thing for a child of God to do. Fear not, only believe. Oh, but pastor, what about fear not, only believe? Well, that should be our motto. That should be something we cling to. That should be something we hold on to. That should be a verse we recite when we get the bad news. It ought to be something more to us as Bible believers. Not to get as rattled as the world. We're not rattled. We fear not. We only believe. Are we prepared? Yes. Are we paying attention? Yes. But I want to be part of the crowd that says, I fear not. I only believe. I hope that's what I can say about myself. And notice what Jesus goes on to say. She shall be made whole. Not every situation does God decide to do this. But in this case, he said, I'm going to. He said, I'll heal her. But Jesus, you don't understand. She's back there. She's gone. I'll take care of it. Fear not. Only believe. My will will be done. <laughs> I'll take care of that. Stop. Take a chill pill. <laughs> I got it. You could see the panic, the sorrow, the sickness, the pain that overwhelmed him. Notice the sorrow. Notice the sickness. Now notice death here. Look at verse 51. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. So he takes the three. Why exactly? I don't know. I tried to understand. I don't know exactly. God, Jesus had a plan with these three men. They were, they were very close to Jesus, and he was going to use them in a great way. He said, you three come in. And as they get in there, verse 52, all wept and bewailed her, but he said, weep not, she is not dead, but sleepeth. They would pay professional people to come in and cry. The louder you would hear crying from a house would mean the more you love that person. So they would hire a bunch of people to come in and they would scream and wail and whine as loud as they possibly could. That was a sign of respect for the dead. That was something. So you can see this has taken some time. The physician came and said, she's gone. There's nothing we can do. Pulled the sheet. Took enough time for the wailers and weeping folks to come. They came. Came inside. They're all screaming. They're all weeping. They're all crying. We see this death. Notice what they do to Jesus. He said, she's not dead, but sleepeth. And I know people go back and forth. And was she in a coma? Was she really dead? I, I, I think she was dead. I think as he goes on to say, he said, no, you guys get out. She, she's not dead. I take care of her. And I think there's more meaning to it. I, I think there's more uh, the, the spirit, what her spirit was at this moment. I think there's more to it. He put them all out and he took her by the hand and called saying, Maid, arise. Now these scoffers, these doubters, these who believe that Jesus was not capable of doing anything, you know what they missed? They missed one of the greatest miracles in all the Bible. If they would have been quiet... I wonder if Jesus would have let them stay. They missed the power that Jesus was going to put on display because they laughed at him and scoffed him. They missed it. I've got to hurry. I've got to be done tonight. But you see the death. You see the sorrow. You see the sickness. You see the death. And then we see the Savior here. Notice verse 55. Her spirit came again. And she arose straightway. And he commanded to give her what? That's right. She wasn't a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. It was not Jesus' time. Now, we're going to see in the next couple chapters, Jesus is going to set his face to Jerusalem. Now is not the time to declare him as the Messiah, declare him as the king. It was not time. That's why Jesus would say, don't go around telling everybody. She's alive, and everyone would find out. She'd go running down the streets. People would hear about it. News would spread. But Jesus told the parents, hold off for a little bit. Don't say anything. It's, it's not my time. 
Jairus would learn God's timing and purpose are not on his timetable. Sometimes God requires patience. Sometimes he waits longer than we think is rational. Listen closely. For Moses, 40 years in a wilderness before God would do something. For Daniel, man, things were, things were not always easy for Daniel the whole time. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took longer. God, where were you at? God, we're getting ready to be thrown in. What you doing? Several people. The story is strange, but I want you to look at the connection here that Luke puts here. Just pay, we're, we're just about done. Twelve years before, this man and his wife gave birth to a little child. The most exciting day in their life, this little girl. Probably she had her daddy wrapped around her finger. Twelve years before, there was a lady who came down with this sickness and this pain. For twelve years, both have lived. One, maybe a little rougher, hard life. We don't know if the, the girl was sick all the time. We don't know that for a fact. But we see two different people for 12 years. At the end of those 12 years, Jesus healed both of them. The central theme is the Savior, is the power of Jesus, is his wonder and his amazement. I have a list of several things we can take, but I want to just say this. Sometimes the Lord's delay brings a greater demonstration of his power. So don't give up. Sometimes the Lord's delay brings a greater demonstration of his power, so don't give up. When you are tempted to ask God why, or why would you allow this, or why have you not answered, or where are you, sometimes the Lord's delay brings a greater demonstration of his power, so don't give up. I think one of the number one sins we as Christians struggle with is a lack of faith. If he is truly capable of doing all these things, why are we wasting so much time in not seeking it? I'm saying that to me tonight. I waste a lot of time on other silly stuff. I try to figure it all out. And I don't spend as much time as I should because I've tried that before. I've tried the prayer thing. I've gone to the prayer meetings. I've done this. I've done that. And I think sometimes God wants to show a greater display of his power through you, but you gave up. You stopped. Stop serving, stop living, stop praying, stop doing what was right. Oh, friend, would we learn from this? I've got a list of things, but we're not going to share them tonight. Would you remember this? Sorrow and sickness and even death, we can have hope because of the Savior. Man, I'm so glad that when I get to do funerals, and it's a privilege for those who know the Lord, it's an honor. We can think of eternity. We can think of it because of Jesus. I hope you'll be encouraged tonight. Don't stop. You keep praying. You stay focused. You have that faith. And you let God show a greater display of his power through you. What if he never heals you? You let God show his power on display through you. What if he never changes my circumstances? You let God show his great power through you. Oh, friend, will we take that message to heart. Tonight, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a few minutes and pray. I'm going to ask you to get into small groups. Uh, maybe find someone you could just kneel and pray with. And if it's two people, maybe you could just ask them, hey, what, what can I pray for you for? We're part of this church fan. We're here. We want to get to know each other. What can I pray for you for? Let's just all spread out throughout the auditorium. Let's be very quiet when you're done. Um, you can exit. Just be very quiet when you do. All right, God bless you. Thank you for joining us on Facebook. Let's take some time to pray.